So hello and welcome to Conserving Plastic Art and Artifacts. And thank you for joining us for this WCG panel discussion. So we have four conservators with varied expertise that work or have worked in the DC area. And although everyone has different specialties, we all deal with plastics. So the aim of this panel is to create a very candid conversation about all of our case studies, our current research and practical treatment advice. So we'd really like to get you all involved in the in the conversation. Um, we'll start with a lightning round for introductions to our panelists, but then followed by open discussion. And so you can enter your questions in the chat for um, um, while they're giving their presentation. But afterwards, um, we'll wait till after all the presentations are complete in order to ask any questions with your microphone. And after they're all complete, you can um, feel free to turn on your, your camera or your microphone um, as you wish. Um, but in the chat currently, which I'll put in, are some of our like easy plastic resources that we compiled just kind of as starting points for anyone interested in learning more about plastics. Um, but our first panelist is creating our soon to be favorite plastics resource, and that is Mary Coughlin. Mary Coughlin is an associate professor in the Museum Studies Program at George Washington University, where she has taught preventive conservation to graduate students full-time since 2009, and is the head of the online graduate certificate program in Museum Collections Management and Care. She is currently on sabbatical writing a book, Caring for Plastics in Collections, which will focus on preventive conservation and collections management issues for plastics. Another panelist tonight, Chris Kanasen will be writing sections for the book about plastic-based textiles. So please welcome Mary and we'll have her share her screen. Thank you. All right, so hopefully that works. Um, so it's time is getting scary. I've been in plastics for almost 20 years now. And this opening slide is sort of the beginning of it all, which was my third year at fellowship year at um, American History. And so I wanted to stay and there was no funding then. And so I thought, what is the collection needs? What am I sort of interested in and where could I get funding? So I always like to acknowledge the Samuel Crest Fellowship um, because they gave me money for a year to study plastics and they really primarily fund mostly European art. So they went out on a limb to fund plastics at American History. Um, my supervisor at the time was the head of the lab, Beth Richwine, who also was interested in plastics and encouraged me to explore it, knowing that American History had a lot in their collections that needed attention. And then Bruno Pouliot, who um, I'm sure a lot of you knew, um, this was also enthusiastic about plastics and preventive conservation. So without all of these people um, and the support, I would not have had the career that I cherish and have loved. When I began, this is like dark ages, right? There really was limited resources about plastics. And so I thought, how am I gonna understand what's happening and so I had accession files, so I knew at least when things were entered into the collection, maybe I had some general history I could research, but what I thought I needed was a timeline. So I could know what plastics were available when, and then using the database and records could narrow down potential options. So I made a timeline. Like there are so many beautiful timelines out there now, but this is one that I made about 20 years ago and then just keep tweaking. And I realized it's important to know not only when a plastic was invented, but perhaps more importantly, when it actually went into manufacturing. So you could realize, is it actually conceivable that the plastic I think it is, is what it is. So I just share that I, I'm a fan of timelines. And then my more recent research over the last few years has involved seeing if ozone test sticks could be repurposed to monitor for polyvinyl chloride or PVC. So these ozone strips are meant to monitor for ozone and they can get a false positive though with oxidative reagents like chlorine. So that made me think, oh, I wonder if I could use these for PVC. So I've, I've published a little bit on it, have given some presentations. There's something there, but I don't, after all these years, don't exactly know what it is. So I like to talk about it in hopes that other people will take up this mantle and do some more research. A little bit of an insight how I've been doing it is I take the ozone test sticks 
Objects I'm curious about, again, PVC, put them in a glass beaker, seal them with aluminum foil wrapped around the edges with parafilm so that it's a tight seal and you're not getting cross-contamination with the greater environment. And then in the jars, I'm also putting um, 80 strips, the ozone test sticks. And then in this case, I was also testing for copper coupons. So the 80 strips will react with acids and the copper coupons, my thought was they react or they're really sensitive to chlorides and oxides. So here in this phase of testing, you'll see details after a day, a few days, over the course of two weeks. And the, the white stick in the middle that eventually turns pretty dark brown, those are the ozone sticks. So this is a really pretty rapid um, positive reaction that was occurring. These are safety goggles that were absolutely disgusting. Like you look at them and they're weeping and they're tacky and they're gross. So I didn't need a test to tell me that they're in bad shape, but it was interesting to see how bad they are. Like something is coming off of them. The 80 strips got a positive, relatively positive reaction for acids and the ozone sticks were really positive. And the copper coupons though didn't do anything. So again, I think there's something there with these ozone sticks. And then just to say, hey, I was getting positive reactions with PVC that actually still looked okay, like this little PVC duck. Um, and then these are magnified um, ozone strips at 220 magnification. So again, something seems to be here. This duck looked okay, it wasn't sticky, it wasn't warping, it wasn't smelly, but it is on its degradation pathway. And all of that was confirmed in a lab with FTIR as a side note. And then as Christine mentioned in the introduction, I am fortunate enough to be on sabbatical right now working on a book, Caring for Plastics and Collection. So it's trying to make the information that's available or that we have as conservators accessible to the broader preservation um, community. And so collections managers and curators and registrars, people who honestly are intimidated by science. So even the great resources that are out there, they may shut down a little bit. And this is the audience that I primarily teach at GW. And so it's this mix of collections management and preventive conservation. And I am super excited for the case studies and the information sharing that are going to come from other people at other institutions. Um, including one of our panelists today, Chris Knossen, um, who specializes in textiles. So that's sort of me historically and in a nutshell currently, and I'm super grateful and excited to be on the panel tonight. Thank you, Mary. I'm so excited for your book also. <laughs> I think it's going to be a great resource, um, especially bringing all those things together. And thanks for kind of giving us a nice intro of just how far we've come with plastics in the past, the past, uh, yeah, 15 years. It's, it's anything. So thank you. Our next panelist will be Chris Kanasen. Chris Knassen is a textile conservator in private practice and the owner of Midwest Textile Conservation, LLC. They hold an MS from the Winther University of Delaware program in art conservation and a bachelor's degree in art history from Vassar College. Prior to entering private practice, Chris trained in textile conservation with a focus in modern and contemporary art and materials at the Indianapolis Museum of Art, Winther Museum, St. Louis Art Museum, the Costume Institute, and the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation. In addition to performing innovative treatments for modern textiles in a collaborative settings, they have conducted research into the wet cleaning of nylon fibers, the use of anoxia, and digitally printed reproduction fabrics. Please welcome Chris. Hi, all. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Washington Conservation Guild, for hosting this. I'm, I'm so excited to be here. And I love that Mary went first because uh, I remember some of those slides from the presentation that you gave my class at Winter Tour, which kind of sparked the seed of my obsession with plastics. Um, so I'm, I'm just so excited. Uh, uh, so yes, I'm Chris Knossen. I'm a textile conservator in private practice. Uh, and I was trying to figure out what I should share during this time, and I decided that I wanted to share what it's like to be a textile conservator working with plastics, as well as uh, someone who interacts with plastics in private practice. Uh, so without further ado, um, what does it mean to be a textile conservator who works with modern materials? Now, I say modern materials because I it 
encompasses a lot of things. When people think plastics, they might not consider man-made fibers, uh, such as nylon. They're some of the most stable plastics because of how they're manufactured, uh, but they still have their little quirks and have to be treated a little bit differently, as well as difficult to identify without um, analysis. Um, so a lot of textile conservators do interact with modern materials, uh, especially if they're interacting with garments because garments are mixed media materials. So uh, the, the content that I'm helping Mary's, Mary with in the book, I'm also working with Christopher Maza, who is an associate conservator at the Costume Institute. They have a lot of materials in their collection that speak uh, really strongly to the kind of concerns that you can face when you mix modern materials and textiles. Now, I don't approach plastics really any differently than an objects conservator does. Uh, it's a little bit of fear and a little bit of, of fascination. Um, but as a textile conservator, almost all textiles need some sort of support, whether on display or in storage. And sometimes the treatment itself can be just the support. Uh, for example, the dress in the um, in the image here, which is a 1966 PVC dress designed by Daniel he Daniel Hetcher, that is in the um, Philadelphia Museum of Art's collection. Um, the treatment that I performed with this for this was a lining that could be stitched into the side um, that would support the garment as it inevitably hardened. So it could still be put on a mannequin and displayed because with textiles, a lot of it is about legibility. With plastics, a lot of it is about legibility. Um, okay, so now what about private practice? I get a lot of questions about, well, what do you do going into private practice? A big one being identification. So I wrote down a few thoughts that I've been thinking about my private practice is very new since September of last year. So I haven't, I don't have a lot of actual experience, just a lot of thoughts. Uh, fostering a relationship with a local college so that you can um, create a symbiotic relationship where you have access to a chemistry lab and resources is something I've been thinking about. Uh, as well as creating basic solutions and methods that are very comfortable for me. I think that a lot of conservators do this automatically, but I, if you just you know, focus it in the plastics, it can make it a little bit easier um, to start with. Considering research time when creating estimates, if you're concerned about a client arguing about that time, you could slip it into something else that they might not uh, have as much of an issue with, such as treatment time. That way you're still getting paid for your time. A big one for me is knowing your limits and leaving it alone. Sometimes the best thing you can do is nothing or, you know, a very, um, you know, ensuring that it's safely stored. This is a big one for me because I, I'm a conservator. We love rabbit holes. Uh, limiting expectations. This is also really important with textiles. If you cleaned a textile before, sometimes you have to inform your client that they might not see too much of a visual change, but the, the chemical stability is, is better off. Uh, similarly, I feel like with plastics, that's also important. And then this is something I think a lot about. Uh, these materials won't last, so what do you need to do to help preserve them? And a big one for me that I've been thinking a lot about is documentation and how you document it. Moving forward, understanding that this material, due to inherent vice, is just not going to last the way it is right now. Okay, that's all. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Chris, and thanks for the added little private practice um, plug, because I think that's such an important um, thing to think about. And even a lot of those tips are also good for people in institutions who might have very like succinct timelines, like kind of knowing those limits and kind of adding in your research time to your treatment estimates, even for like a curator or for um exhibitions people is also so important <laughs> so thanks for that little add-in um our next 
panelist is Kiri Douglas. She holds a BA in Conservation of Cultural Heritage from the University of Lincoln and an MA in Conservation Artwork on Paper from Camberwell College of Arts, London. Having had placements in both national institutions and private studios during her studies, Kiri went on to complete graduate internship at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles. In 2021, she joined the National Museums Scotland in Edinburgh as an assistant paper conservator before beginning her current role as the Andrew W. Mellon Fellow in Paper Conservation at the National Gallery of Art, Washington, DC. Please welcome Carrie. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, let's see if this is working. Um, OK, so yeah, so excited to be on this panel, especially with it being so interdisciplinary. Um, that's a real big part of what I think is so important right now in working with plastics. Um, so I'm just going to give a quick overview of um, my research project, um, which is based on synthetic paper. Um, so this is just really explaining what it is. So I'm happy to go into um, more details in the Q&A. Um, so this is just a, um, a chart I've made to show the most common types of processes and materials that come under the umbrella term of synthetic paper. Um, so I've split these up into three groups. Um, so there's non-woven material uh, where fibers are laid into webs in a dry, wet or melted state. And then we have extruded films. Um, and here papers can be predominantly made from um, thermoplastics like uh, polypropylene, HDPE or polyester. Um, but there's also these papers known as mineral rich or stone papers where the bulk of the paper is actually made from calcium carbonate. Um, <laughs> and there's just like a small amount of HDPE holding it all together. Um, and then finally, there are also hybrid configurations that utilizes um, polymer coatings or laminations. Um, so everyone here will have come across this paper somehow, even if you haven't realized it. Um, they're kind of water, chemical and tear resistant. So they're often used when a durable material is needed. Um, so things like outdoor environments, food packaging, hospitals. Um, and so you can see everyday items in public collections, especially archives and libraries. Um, and here you can also see actually a banknote as part of an artwork. Um, but also synthetic paper has been used um, for yeah artworks, books and journals, sculptures, maps and so forth. Um, so first, these are some artworks at the National Gallery. Um, which are made from non-woven viscous rayon. Um, and so these look like a fibrous paper, like you can kind of tell there's something a bit weird about them. There's not conventional paper. Um, but uh, the definition of synthetic papers are quite complicated. Um, there's lots of arguments about what kind of could or couldn't be considered a paper, um, but I think it's really worth considering the form and function of the item. Um, and again, at least with these, you can tell they're synthetic paper. Um, we also have artworks like these two uh, prints that are part of like larger print series. Um, and um, I've surveyed collections across the UK and the US, and there's been hundreds of items on synthetic paper. And a lot of them have just been described as being on just conventional paper. So we obviously don't know that they have these plastic components, which, um, which is gonna be a problem eventually. Um, and so this print by Coalfield is on Neobond, which is um, a mixture of synthetic fibers with an acrylic binder. And then actually this print by Dorothea Rockburn is on um, transparent papers where there's an inner layer of a plastic film. And then here's an artwork on Terra Skin. Um, so this is a stone paper. Um, and there's been some research about silver point actually tarnishing on stone papers, um, but also here's some UV images of um, terra skin in a from our paper sample collection here at the National Gallery, and you can see all of our fingerprints on them. Um, so this is something that's worth considering with these 
artworks that we should be wearing gloves with them, which we don't normally do with conventional paper. Um, and then also, again, this is another booklet um, of Kim Dora, which is a synthetic paper made from polypropylene. And again, um, it shows that these papers are absorbent. Um, optical brightness from the label has um, transferred over. And also you can see some fingerprints and there's also this green fluorescence that I'm not sure exactly what's caused it, but it's something has had an effect on this paper. Um, and again, so here are some maps. Um, so completely different to artworks, but also I think this is interesting, kind of hopefully we can speak to Chris too. It's funny how you have materials like Tyvek that can be both textiles and papers. Uh, we have paper samples of Tyvek in this kind of hard-like structure, uh, which is much more similar to paper. And you've got maps at New York Public Library on these Tyvek. Um, but also we've got maps on polyart, which is a more recent um, synthetic paper made from um, high density polyethylene. And again, if we look at that sample booklet, um, there's actually, it shows some possible optical brightness, which isn't actually something I'm noticing in a lot of other synthetic papers. Um, also, this could be coatings, um, but it shows how um, synthetic papers are developing that there are now um, several different types of papers with the same brands um, and they're making them specific to different printing methods and again kind of a slight textile shift um, but in the 60s we have the kind of um, paper dress craze that happened um, <laughs> I'm sure Chris has come across some of these um, and um, these this kind of started because of the Scott Paper Company, um, which manufactured paper towels, toilet paper, napkins, that sort of thing. Um, but um, it kind of just all kind of blew out of proportion. Everyone got on the craze. Um, and so this is an example from the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, and this is a Scott Paper Company dress called the Paper Caper. And um, it's made from Jura weave, or that's what they've called it. Um, which is a bit ironic because it's a non-woven. It's um, made from rayon and um, kind of their napkin paper stock, I guess. Um, but you can see how it's fragile, it's delaminating, um, it's really brittle. And then also a competitor of um, Scott Paper is Kimberly Clark, and they made their own paper, synthetic paper called K-Cell, uh, which is their kind of paper, napkin, toilet paper stock made with nylon. Um, and again, you can see here how, how brittle it's become. And then getting towards the end. Um, also, we can have sculptures. Um, so Noriko Ambe is an artist who makes cut paper sculptures, some much bigger than this. Um, but this is just an example from the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. And um, this is on Yippo, which is a polypropylene paper. And again, we've got books, artist books made with these papers. Um, I really love this book. It's on translucent yippo, so you can see the writing on the pages behind. Um, and so you're kind of reading it and seeing it come through. And then we also have, in terms of deterioration, there's also yellowing of these papers. So I don't think it's super clear in this um, photo. Um, but in person it was, but the image on the right has yellowed compared to the watercolor on the left. And so this yellowing is likely due to phenolic antioxidants um, that have put in the paper to try and make them more stable, um, but they are causing yellowing. Although I can see in patterns, um, more recent ones that they're starting to phase out these phenolic antioxidants. So hopefully there'll be less yellowing in future papers, um, which is also a problem because you might think that you have found out, oh, I've got Yippo, great, I've identified this, but Yippo made now, Yippo made in 10 years, and Yippo made 10 years before now, or from, you know, the early 70s, um, is not going to be the same material anyway, um, which is quite frustrating. Um, and then also there's um, fracturing that can happen, warping, um, cracking, and so this is um, a, a close-up of a uh, painting by Lisa Albuquerque. Um, 
And so, yes, we're looking at um, kind of UV light causing this, um, but also kind of temperatures can change and, and cause uh, more deterioration. Um, so just finally, yeah, my current research is actually looking at methods of um, treating in brittles and warped synthetic paper. Um, I'm kind of looking at doing using heat to soften the material and reshape it um, into a more kind of homogeneous surface. Um, so I'll be testing different heat tools and seeing what kind of effect this has, and I'll be aging my samples to see um, the long-term effects of, of using heat to try and bring these papers back together somehow. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kiri. I'm very excited to see where that research goes. Um, also, it's really interesting how many collections that uh, synthetic paper really is, and it's really kind of pervasive, which is great um, for our cross multimedia panel. <laughs> um, next up, we have, excuse me one moment. Um, Alexa is beeping at me. <laughs> Alexa, stop. Sorry. Um, apologies. Next up, we have Luke Moses. Uh, Luke Moses is time-based media conservator at the National Portrait Gallery in DC, where he has worked since 2019. A graduate of New York University's Moving Image Archiving and Preservation MA program, Luke drifted through various archiving and conservation positions and projects at the Frick Art and Reference Library, University of Baltimore, and Smithsonian American Art, among others, before landing in the Mid-Atlantic. He currently resides in Baltimore with his partner and cat and is trying to start a band. Welcome, Luke. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I'll be talking about time-based media art conservation. Uh, time-based media art, for those who don't know, is a uh, kind of a fuzzy umbrella term for art objects and collections that include film, videotape, uh, audio, digital, and electronic um, art materials, either in whole or uh, as components making up parts of larger objects. Uh, a bit about my background so you can get a sense of the kind of generalized approach that I have to, to TVMA and art objects and plastics, especially, is uh, my uh, graduate degree is really in uh, audiovisual archiving and preservation. But that meant that we spent time with a wide variety of, of formats of film and, and videotape and digital objects and all sorts of related equipment and machinery. Um, but studies there kind of reflected what ends up being, you know, pretty appropriate for the, the wide variety within time-based media art collections and the need for a holistic approach that can account for gaps in knowledge. Then um, my own work experience since um, was really kind of like a hodgepodge of maybe parts of these things, you know, at different moments, focusing on just film special collections and or just videotape preservation or web archiving the sum total of which prepare me for time-based media art uh, conservation, which kind of pulls from all of these different categories. Um, plastics in particular, and the, the time-based media art collection, um, in my experience, they're very, very common, but not often the artwork itself as such, at least in the National Portrait Gallery's case, although you know that varies. Um, there's plastic in, in just about everything you know, that comes through the collection, you know, substrates, mounts, bases, cases, protective sheets and layers, um, components of machines and display equipment. Um, that's a, a few examples of some recent projects that are interesting and involve plastics. Here we have uh, Harmonics One um, by the artist Simone Forti. Uh, made in the mid 70s in collaboration with the pioneering holographer Lloyd Cross. It's a holographic polyester film in between two sheets of mylar mounted to a plexiglass support on a wooden base structure with an LED light source inside the wooden case. This was acquired in 2020 um, and the holographic film was duplicated in 2021 prior to the exhibition. The original film um, is currently in 
pool storage and we're displaying one of those duplicates at the moment in the museum. Um, here we have Her Luminous Distance, an artwork by Aura Satz. Um, it's a dual analog slide projector artwork with 35 millimeter film slides, a Problacom blink comparator, um, which you can kind of see on the front of the, the projectors there, which alternatingly blocks one of the two projectors. Um, there's an Arduino controller, a motor, and an audio soundtrack playing as well. The 35 millimeter slides were duplicated in uh, 2022 and 2023. This is currently on display also. Um, it was the wish of the artist that it be maintained as an analog artwork and to not transition it to digital projectors, which is common, I think, for a lot of uh, formerly analog slide projector artworks. Um, here we have uh, Stormy at Stonewall by LJ Roberts. Um, this is not on display yet, but it'll be installed this summer at the Portrait Gallery. Um, we have a series of neon light boxes that have a, a range of materials, plywood, paint, uh, copper, glass, uh, a few different types of metals and plastics. Um, it has an oscillator, which blinks the lights of the light boxes. They're Duratrans prints. On the right, you can sort of see that there is, um, on, sitting on top of the plywood, plywood is that there are layers of acrylic and polycarbonate um, uh, around the Duratrans prints. So when we're uh, approaching um, TBMA conservation, we often have to start with a pretty broad uh, list of, of questions before we can kind of narrow down the approach. And we're asking ourselves and the artists and their representatives, um, what is the artwork in question? What is being offered? These are not necessarily the same thing, you know, especially with uh, TBMA. There are often duplicates and versions and, and things like that. You know, what would caring for this work require? Resources such as equipment, time, money, expertise. Um, it's often the case that we'll bring stuff in that have materials that no one in our you know, department has worked with before. Um, we have not had an objects conservator on staff at the portrait gallery for a long time. We currently have a contract objects conservator, which has been wonderful. Um, and how might the task to preserve and display this work change over time? Um, so what are we looking at to answer these questions? We're looking at the objects and materials themselves, um, artist interviews, if they don't exist, we'll conduct them. Um, exhibition histories, installation guides, and documentation. You know, what do people do with this sort of artwork or object? Has this been displayed before? What choices do people make? Um, internal and external records, if it's part of the collection. Um, and conservation research and the materials, um, histories of the materials, their production, and so on. Um, and here's a quote uh, that is from uh, a, a book by one of my professors and at least uh, contributed to by one of my professors in grad school that um, I think speaks to a pretty common approach in time-based media art conservation. Uh, and the quote is, what keeps a video instrument alive and mysterious versus codified and narrowly defined is a shared concern. What constitutes aliveness has been an ongoing theme in time-based media art conservation. For example, analogies are common between media art installation and performance, where the ideas and processes of the work, rather than any particular manifestations, may be considered the essence of the work. If the artist is not available, the conservator may rely too rigidly upon previous components and insist upon certain parameters that deaden the piece. This is from uh, Preserving Machines, but I think it can be pretty broadly applied to a lot of the stuff that we, we do in time-based media art conservation. And uh, there's a kind of a sense of installation as a, a form of care with uh, time-based media art, where often the understanding of an object might shift over time and in different contexts. And we kind of ask, and I ask, uh, is the fill in the blank component part of the artwork or is it what makes the artwork possible? And not always clear answers, but it's a, it starts a conversation. Uh, thanks to everyone for inviting me. Thank you, Luke. Oh, there we go. And thank you for that little primer about kind of the approach to time-based media art. I found, um, I think that framework for kind of that values-based um, assessment of an artwork can be actually really helpful when we move into other types of 
of artifacts and artworks. I think um, kind of thinking about the history and how it's used now, how it's intended to be displayed, um, that really plays into a lot of um, every type of conservation. So I think that that's really uh, a great segue. Um, so we don't have any questions up in the chat yet, but feel free to put them in, or if you prefer, you can um, unmute yourself and ask in person, but um, I'll start off with a general question to the group and maybe kind of building off of um, uh, Luke's kind of mention of his approach. Um, do you all, and you can just answer one by one, um, does your approach vary when you come into these different types of collection objects, whether it's an artwork, like a lot of you talked about all of these, all of your own artifacts that you work with are in design collections and history collections, um, kind of historical objects versus an artwork or um, an object that's going to be kind of used or handled. Um, yeah, does your approach change with these different types of kind of groups versus like historic or use object versus an artwork? Yeah, Chris, let's start off. Um, I love this question. So yes, but not strictly just because of the institution or um, or the the what the artwork is, uh, but I like um, I like to recognize that there are multiple priorities being placed on this artwork, and I like to identify them, and I like to establish which ones are being placed ahead of which, and that can be that can be very much informed by the institution, the curator's needs, the artist's needs, um, as well as the the purpose of the object itself. Great, Kiri. Um, yeah, I think in my perspective as well, I think I would be thinking about how many items I had in terms of, I think, when looking at synthetic paper, you know, if it's in a library, I've, I already know the British Library has over 100, you know, it's in it's in the hundreds, Library Congress is the same. Um, so I wouldn't be approaching them maybe the same as I would as an artwork in a in a gallery where like I think we have maybe 10 here at the National Gallery. Um, but also it's difficult in terms of handling too. Like I know everyone wants to handle maps, let's say that's kind of the point of them. Um, whereas artworks, I could maybe think about more kind of a, a storage solution that also was a display all in one to try and prevent handling from happening um, or think ahead knowing that this is gonna start warping. I wanna make sure there's some space for that. Um, and, and there's not gonna be space for that type of bespoke storage solution maybe in a library or an archive um, or, or yeah or even cold storage if that was something I felt was really necessary for something really fragile um, again that's that's unlikely to happen with large quantities your excellent point with your um, quantity in a paper land is very different than, than a bespoke artwork for sure Christine we have some questions in the chat um one from uh, Julie is um, with your audio background, Luke, what format was the audio soundtrack of the SOTS piece? And was it necessary to conserve the soundtrack as well and how? Yeah, in this particular case, I believe the audio came in the form of a stereo MP3 file. Um, if we can get involved in you know, the, the artist process, early enough, we might have certain, you know, requests about deliverables and things, you know, there are pretty, I think, kind of standardized formats for uh, ideal preservation audio files, you know, we might have certain specs and ask for a wave file of, you know, this or that quality, if it's possible. Um, there's cases where we also ask for um, access if the artist is willing to see some of their, you know, production files and stuff like that, if we feel like there's some useful information there. Um, but also sometimes and in a case like this, you just kind of get what you get, you know, what's available. It's not always the case that an artist is holding on to, to all of that 
you know, stuff that they've been working from, you know, maybe on one computer and then don't keep track of it over the years or something. I mean, the audio file they had was was of good quality, but it was also essentially the only real option. And with our uh, digital asset management system at the Smithsonian, it means that we put that file in, into there and it's at least, you know, considered safe. Thank you. Uh, Emily has her hand raised. We're going to um, jump in with her first. I do. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I don't mean to cut in line or anything like that. Um, <laughs> hi, Chris. Hi, panelists. Uh, I have a, I'm curious about your thoughts on accelerated aging in plastics research, because it's the best tool we have, but I have uh, a lot of frustrations about it myself. So in your work, do you rely on it? Do you rely on it with caveats? Do you, I don't know. What'd you do? Thank you. It's a, that's a really good question. In some ways it feels analogous to us, like all hating the Audi test, but needing the Audi test. Um, and so since that's essentially accelerated aging as well, I, I think it's almost the, what we can do now. And pre um, session, the panelists were, we were all talking about our little bit of a concern that this was being recorded most because we were like, Oh, what if we say something that in a few years time, we actually don't agree with anymore. Um, because this is what happens with plastics, like research continues and it changes. And the things we think now may not actually hold in the future, but we're all just making the most informed decision that we can now. And I think accelerated aging can be a tool in that, but obviously it's best if we know there's limitations. Um, yeah, I'll be aging my samples for my research project. And um, yeah, it's it's not, you know, <laughs> it's, I feel like the fact that I have examples of how these papers age um, in real life, I've got um, artworks that, you know, examples of artworks in collections that have been, that have, ha have been in a bad environment, um, which means I know that this can happen and that aging them is giving me a similar result is helpful in terms of me to check what might be changing based on my treatments um i'm not using it in the sense of um i know in 50 years this is exactly how they're going to age at all i'm not using it in terms of to help date this type of deterioration um but it's good for some kind of like characteristic analysis um based on on treatment as there's nothing else I can really do um but yeah it does help that I've got real life examples to compare and also something I wanted to bring up um I think some plastics we're seen as are seen as very stable and then we think oh well they're in a museum environment we don't have you know we have UV filtra um, filtration or um you know we have good humidity and temperature controls but actually from my survey a lot of at least for um synthetic paper I've seen um, a lot of it has been gifted to museums or archives or libraries. Um, it's not necessarily that it's been acquired straight away. And so they've been in private homes, um, which could be in not so great of an environment in front of, you know, on top of a radiator or right next to a window, more than likely. Um, and so that's something also, I think, to think about. Um, yeah. Yeah, those naturally aged samples are always uh, such a godsend. So. Keep hoarding weird plastic bits, everyone. We'll need them later. <laughs> uh, we got a question from Ruth uh, in the chat that I really thought was interesting. She says, um, do we consider accepting the death of the objects? Shouldn't we learn to deal with that too? Not that I'm encouraging destruction, of course. Um, excellent question. What do you all think about that? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Chris. I love this question. It's it's not something that keeps me up at night in fear anymore. It's more of a, <laughs> just, just really ruminating on it. Um, so this was, this was my last point about um, understanding that these materials, even if they last, they won't last in their current condition. And so really prioritizing documentation of the object um, at the time and its, its forms of significance, I think is really important to me because not that we are doing the destruction, but we, to some extent, need to acknowledge that they won't last. 
not the way that other materials last. So yeah, I, I think about that constantly. <laughs> I'll Definitely. throw in that I, that I do too, and that's something I, I try to emphasize when I when I lecture is that yeah, documentation is really important because not only is it going to show us if something's changed, it could be that all that lasts in the collection because deaccessioning does not have to be a dirty word in collections. It can be part of just upkeep. Um, and then also to think about, you know, um, and I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> it'll, it'll come back. But yeah, just that, that, but yeah, the plastics change and that's just as, you know, as things, as they are meant to be. So mm -hmm. as kind of a follow-up to that, um, have any of you dealt with reproductions of things, especially as kind of the, the death of the original object? Um, have you moved into reproductions? Can I jump in here and say, um, I haven't dealt with reproductions, so um, someone else can do oh, that sure. bit, but um, I was just going to say, yeah in terms of like stone papers they're meant to biodegrade a part of why they're being pushed right now is for sustainability mm -hmm. reasons people think that it's it's better than kind of deforestation for paper um so they're meant to disappear um in well there'll be tiny microplastics but you know the actual paper itself <laughs> is meant to disappear um and so yes yeah, so we're thinking about documentation how we kind of migrate information about this artwork and then yeah future plans of reiteration what 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 does that look like and i guess this is where perhaps reproduction is the way or, or speaking with living artists if possible um about what that might mean is that something we want maybe then we don't want it maybe we do just want to deaccession and and that was the life of that artwork and part of it mm -hmm. um yeah, it's a big topic. Um yeah that's all I've got on yeah, that. <laughs> the uh the documentation side and of it kind of fits in with how we're accessioning um, the TBMA works and kind of getting all of that information in early and, and thinking about how that information lives, <laughs> which is definitely an important aspect of it too. Um, yeah, Luke. Um, I will say I also uh, think about the death and destruction of objects a lot. <laughs> um, and uh, for, a number of reasons it's sort of like perpetually in in the background of this sort of work i mean there are some things where uh displaying them is inherently destructive um there are you know some machines that we use that just aren't meant to be on all the time you know like analog slide projectors there are um like the holographic film artwork that i showed if we really wanted it to last forever, it would only ever be in storage, which is partly why we made duplicates, <laughs> is that keeping it in the environmental conditions of a gallery, uh, damage it over time, keeping it, you know, with the light exposed to light damages it over time. Um, but at least in a case like that, we're reasonably certain, and the artist is still alive, and we spoke to at length, um, that uh, the overall effect of it and having a duplicate of a holographic film in the same display style as they had shown it previously meant that the experience of being around the artwork was you know so similar as to be indistinguishable um and there are other you know things like with like videotape where the the rate of degradation and decay uh is such that you know those sorts of components um sort of uh have to be you know, migrated in some form or have to change or they will cease to, you know, exist in some way, you know, from tape decay to, you know, uh, machine obsolescence and so forth. And then a sort of a larger, more abstract sense, um, I often wonder with a lot of these works, like at what point might they no longer be viable in the way that the artist intended? And that point really, uh, you know, comes to a head with a lot of these artworks that are so technology specific or material specific. There might be, you know, something really important about the particular, you know, materials and, you know, objects that they've chosen to work with that will not, you know, last for many, many years. Um, and museums are making, and you know, conservation professionals are making all sorts of decisions about it. Um, I think in terms of like video art, you know, people are uh, taking, you know, like hoarding CRTs for showing old VR <laughs> or faking them also, you know, by putting like 
you know, flat screens with different sorts of like curved screens or just like, you know, using emulation to make it appear as if it's curved and stuff like that. Um, but I do think that it's probably there are a lot of artworks that are not really uh, maintained in, in their original spirit. And that's a that's a difficult conversation to have. And I don't know that everyone always really knows how to do it, especially because to some degree there might be a, you know, a conflict of interest too when they become part of like collections and stuff like that. I don't know if everyone always has the a clear head about it. Excellent point. Um, Ruth has a follow up mention um, in the the comments. She says, "Be careful with the documentation supported on technology digital. We'll have another problem, obsolescence, another kind of death." Definitely. And then she says, should we learn to document orally based, which reminds me of a professor I had in uh, art history who said the future of contemporary art was going to be just everyone speaking at like the medieval bard about what object once was, <laughs> which I also think about a lot. Um, so I uh, enjoyed that comment. Um, now that we're getting close to time, we can go over a bit. Oh, sorry. Go on. Go on, Chris. I'll be really quick. Uh, so mm -hmm. speaking of reproduction, as well as documentation, yeah. um, there's a treatment I did for the Indianapolis Museum of Art as they were preparing for the exhibition Stephen Sprouse Rock Art Fashion, or some combination of that, um, where an entire collection of his, he used polyurethane film um, in a 1999-2000 collection, and all of it had degraded to pretty much an unexhibitable state. And so I did do reproduction, uh, a I replaced the plastic on that one of the dresses in order for it to be displayed. And part of the documentation I saw for that was the patterning of the original dress itself. Because cool. I didn't intend my replacement plastic to be the final. I intend the, the dress to continue into perpetuity or for someone to come back if need be. Um, to, to deal with that. And if uh, anyone wants more information about that, I, that's my email address. Um, so th I, there are other forms of documentation because I also, oh, that is one of the things that actually does keep me up at night is <laughs> the obsolescence of my documentation. For sure. I think about that a lot too. Um, I think we're going to go into a couple um, possibly quicker questions. We'll see if they are quicker. Um, we had a question about our thoughts on Tyvek from Jennifer Kim. She says, what are your thoughts on the widespread use of plastics like Tyvek for storage solutions? Are there risks involved? For example, the use of optical brighteners for the artwork. So have, has anyone looked into Tyvek um, or those specifics? If not, just say no, it's okay too. <laughs> I'll just throw in that I think we <laughs> use probably more plastics than we might inherently realize. Mm -hmm. And so we assume polyethylene, we really are hoping polyethylene is stable because we're using it so many forms like Tyvek and Ethafilm and Valora. But the longer we use them, probably issues will show. And I think in some cases are, like we've all seen yellow polyethylene bags and things like that. The other mm -hmm. thing, in case you don't realize it, that's a heavy fire load. So just can throw that out there. That's an excellent point. Yeah, we don't think about fire load a lot. Um, <laughs> that's super important. Okay, yeah. So we're in an economy that prioritizes profit over most anything else, and plastic <laughs> is profitable. Um, and so it might be something that's a larger issue, not just we as conservators, because we're we're constantly just trying to do the best we can. Um, so also remember that. <laughs> Excellent. Um, kind of bouncing off of the sustainability thread, uh, Dan asks in the chat about microplastic, especially concerning Olympic plastics and collections. Has anyone um, kind of dealt with my, the idea about microplastics in your in your collections? Or if not, I have one anecdote for this. Um, there is a thing called a guppy bag that you can wash your microfiber cloths in. <laughs> and will help with um, the microplastics that shed off of the cloths when you are doing your wash. Um, and so there, there's like a thousand other different types as well, but that's just one small way. Um, of course, we're not tackling the big problems of microplastics, which are uh, larger corporations, but it's one small way you can um, help in your own practice. Um, also letting your acrylic paint harden and then peel it off and throw it away instead of mixing it into water and dumping it down the drain. Just two little microplastic <laughs> tips for you all. <laughs> um, but does anyone else have any uh, um, thoughts about that? 
So not about microplastics, but it's sort of in the line of, of sustainability as, as researchers are figuring out how to move away from fossil fuels for plastic, you can basically make most types of plastics plant-based and chemically, mm -hmm. the only way to know the difference is by carbon dating because fossil fuels are going to be so much older than the plant-based ones. But you can get PVC and polyurethane, all of them, which I think is just fascinating. Oh, that's very cool. I didn't know that's what, how you would uh, identify them. That's really interesting. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, um, that's, that's really interesting. I've also looked into the sustainability of this because bamboo fibers, which are a semi-synthetic, uh, are something I, I'm, I'm fascinated by but the additives might not be biodegradable. So there's, there's, it's so much, there's like, you can't even trust the research they've done because <laughs> with microplastics and those guppy things, we're actually shedding a lot of natural fibers into the waterways, which is also a concern for wildlife. And I'm, I don't know if the guppy bags are, are holding onto that or if they're shedding their own plastics. So there's so much research that needs to be done. For sure, that's a very good point. Definitely. Um, just check in some more. Um, kind of switching gears, Brian has a specific question. Has anyone dealt with Epson Paper Lab A8000, an office dry paper making system? I don't even know what that is, Brian, but does our panelists? I don't <laughs> know, curious? but I'm happy to look into it. It sounds interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, look to see if we have any other lingering ones. If you haven't gotten your question answered, you can also resend it. I'm just searching through these back ones. Oh, here's a nice one from Julie. Um, what have you found in your practices was the oldest plastic project you worked to restore or not restore? <laughs> um, so what are some early plastics you guys have all worked with? Um, so this nitrate and slow acetate not always in a bad way. Like sometimes they degrade spectacularly. And if we're honest with ourselves, we probably get excited when we see them be doing bad things. It's like a dirty secret I think we all carry. <laughs> um, but I will say imitation ivory cellulose nitrate actually aged pretty well in the collections. Um, so that uh, not, not really a treatment, but just um, for rehousing purposes, that was a comfort. Yeah, I think the whole cellulose um, acetate and nitrate are really good examples of how the manufacturing and additives and then later environmental um, can really change how they um, how they age and how, what condition they can be in. Because you can have some that are in just such great condition and then others that are just completely exploding. Um, so I think that's a really good kind of tie back into what we um, talked about a little bit with... Um, Oh, Chris made a comment um, earlier about the the additives and the kind of, um, I'll just read it out for you, um, for you and then maybe Chris, you can respond. <laughs> but you mentioned, uh, they mentioned that um, the super interesting thing about plastics, additives can help with some of the agents of deterioration or make them worse. And I tend to think of that the closer the plastic is to the date of invention, the less stable it might be because the manufacturers haven't figured out the exact cocktail of additives yet. I think you're seeing that a lot with a lot of the 3D printing polymers too, um, with kind of um, testing out new ways to make that more um, more easily uh, better properties for working properties of the actual printing process, but then the actual um, like stable properties are very different. So does anyone have any kind of learning about those additives and that those production processes? Any uh, further thoughts on that? Um, I think I would just say I find it quite funny with the additives because you kind of I don't know I, I think in my head that it would as the future goes on that it would make things better but often I don't know we think oh this is going to be great this is showing really <laughs> great um, properties this is going to be perfect and then it's only later down the line that you realize oh actually this is this is now not okay actually um and so again, in my head, I think, oh, well, I'm, I'm picturing synthetic paper in 10 years to be, to be better, to be more stable. But there might have been this trendy additive that everyone was like, oh, this is great. And then 10 years after that, we're going to be like, that was the worst thing that, that they did. They should <laughs> never have used it. Um, but we just won't know either. Um, so, yeah. Can yeah, I just it, ask you a question about additives? So you said the phenolic antioxidant cause is causing the yellowing. 
Do you think it's causing it or do you think it's been used up? And how could you determine that? I, right, I'm going to think now. Um, <laughs> I think it's causing it because it's oxidation. It's being oxidized and then it's making quinones, which is causing some of the yellowing, I think. Um, and there's some research on this in terms of just plastic industry. Um, and also there's research into, you know, um, I think polypropylene can also be turned pink slightly. And it's funny because they also say they just blast it with a bit of UV and it goes back, um, which I'm like, I can't do that with an artwork. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there's also um, research on this in terms of inkjets. So they're starting to see inkjet papers because they're so absorbent. Um, they actually absorb these same antioxidants from other plastics that are in contact with inkjet papers. So um, like if they're in clear fat, flat files or if we've used tape as kind of um, kind of like a mylar tape over it or something like that on the corners, um, it's ab absorbing into the inkjet papers and they're getting yellowing on their edges too now. Um, and that's what people think that is causing that. They're not quite sure, but it seems to be more of a from the plastics to the paper rather than the paper itself. Um, and that's what I assume is causing a lot of the yellowing in our synthetic papers. Um, yeah, but I, I could be wrong. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. <laughs> no, thank you. I was wondering. Appreciate but yeah, it does seem to be they're noticing it too, or at least they're realizing that this is part of the problem because yeah, recent patents are moving away from that. Um, Cause I can see like master batch additives that they're considering in their recipes and a lot of the new ones have certain options that have, have removed that from them yeah definitely um it's about six minutes after our scheduled time so i think we're gonna start wrapping up but i wanted to leave us with one um more thing uh, um nadia in the chat asked about identifying plastics and kind of what conventions there are for that and uh Ashley added the plastics identification tool to that, which I know is a favorite of the panelists here. Um, it's I just like to give a shout out to that resource. Um, it's really great if you don't have analytical tools, it um, to give you kind of the the general plastic type. Um, as we're, we were just talking about additives, that of course won't won't tell you what kind of additives and what other types of things are involved. But it's a great starting point when you don't have the analytical tools. Um, and another mention, I loved Chris's idea about getting in contact with um, like a local university um, to kind of see if you can get some of those resources. Uh, collaboration is definitely what plastics is all about and definitely necessary. Um, so thank you guys. This is great questions. Um, I wish we could talk all night, but I won't keep you from your dinners. <laughs> um, I'll turn it over to Rachel for some closing remarks. Oh, Chris, I don't think it does cover man-made fibers. Can you make one for us? <laughs> thank you. Well, I just want to say uh, a big thank you to our panelists, to Kiri, Luke, Mary, and Chris. Um, also really want to thank Christine for bringing all of our panelists together tonight. Um, it was a really great discussion and I feel like we could just keep going on. We have a lot of great questions. Um, I, sorry, I forgot got to almost forgot to uh thank some of our sponsors i'm just going to quickly share my screen um our sponsor some of our sponsors this year university products kramer pigments bonsai fine arts uh conserve space saver interiors dorfman museum figures and the smithsonian national collections program uh they have uh, really helped us by being able to, uh, allowing us to continue our programming and hosting events like this tonight. So a big thank you to them as well. Um, and uh, I think on that, I will let everyone go and um, can follow up with all of our panelists by email. And we'll be posting this on our YouTube channel in the near future. Thank you and have a great night. <laughs>